Hey there, welcome to LiveWire. I'm your host, Luke Burbank. Boy, do we have a show in store for you this week. First up, comedian and Daily Show correspondent Dulce Sloan. She's going to tell us about her memoir, Hello Friends, stories of dating, destiny, and day jobs, which covers all of those topics and her mom's weird multi-decade opposition to her joining the color guard in high school. And also that one time she dated an auto mechanic so she could get a free tune-up. Then we're going to talk to filmmaker Brian Lindstrom about his latest project, Lost Angel, the genius of Judy Sill. It tells the real story of an L.A. folk singer from the 1970s who in just two years went from living in her car to the cover of Rolling Stone and then back to relative obscurity. And then speaking of incredible music, we've got some from S.G. Goodman, who joined us in Iowa not that long ago. You do not want to miss this. So stick around. Livewire gets started right after this. I'm Alex Schwartz. I'm Nomi Fry. I'm Vincent Cunningham, and this is Critics at Large, a New Yorker podcast for the culturally curious. Each week, we're going to talk about a big idea that's showing up across the cultural landscape, and we'll trace it through all the mediums we love. Books, movies, television, music, art. And I always want to talk about celebrity gossip, too. Of course. We hope you'll join us for new episodes each Thursday. Follow Critics at Large today, wherever you get podcasts. This episode of LiveWire is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. What if comparing car insurance rates was as easy as putting on your favorite podcast? With Progressive, it is. Just visit the Progressive website to quote with all the coverages you want. You'll see Progressive's direct rate, and then their tool will provide options from other companies so you can compare. All you need to do is choose the rate and coverage you like. Quote today at Progressive.com to join the over 28 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Comparison rates not available in all states or situations. Prices vary based on how you buy. Hey, Elena. Hey, Luke. How's it going? It is just going absolutely spectacular this week, mostly because... It's time for station location identification examination. Are you ready to play? Yes, I am so ready. I'm, I'm, I'm pumped. This is the part of the show where I quiz Elena on a place in the country. Livewire's on the radio. She's got to guess where we are talking about. I feel like you might get it from the first hint. This place is the home of Carhenge, a replica of Stonehenge constructed with automobiles. It is north of this city. Uh, it's it's somewhere in Nebraska, but I don't know the town. Uh-huh. The guy's name is like Jim Reindeer or something like that. Who- His name is absolutely Jim Reindeer. My goodness. <laughs> okay, you're in the right state. It is Nebraska. It is a, a smallish place in Nebraska, so I may just give it to you. The second half of Ann Patchett's 1997 novel, The Magician's Assistant, is set entirely in this place in Nebraska. Oh, I don't know that, but I do love Ann Patchett. When you form... A group of people, not a disparate group. Quorum, Nebraska. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty close. Alliance, Nebraska, where we are on KTNE, part of Nebraska Public Media. So shout out to everybody in Alliance taking a listen this week. Should we get to the show? Let's do it. All right, take it away. From PRX, it's... <laughs> This week, comedian Dulce Sloan. The book's called Hello Friends, Stories of Dating, Destiny, and Day Jobs. I wanted to call it, don't call it a memoir, I'm only 39. (laughs) And filmmaker Brian Lindstrom. She knew that that music saved her life, and she really felt like she was put on this earth to share that music with the masses and save their lives, too. With music from S.G. Goodman and our fabulous house band, I'm your announcer, Elena Passarello, and now, the host of LiveWire, Luke Burbank. Thank you so much, Elena Passarello. Thanks to everyone tuning in from all over the country, including Alliance, Nebraska. We have a wonderful show in store for you this week. Of course, we've asked the LiveWire listeners a question. We asked, who is an underappreciated artist you think more people should know about? This is kind of in reference to Judy Sill, who we're going to be hearing about coming up. Brian Lindstrom made a documentary film about her. Uh, We're going to hear the listener responses in just a moment. First, though, it's time for the best news we heard all week. 
This right here is our little reminder at the top of the show. There is some good news happening out there in the world. Elena, what's the best news you heard all week? We've been doing these best newses for a couple years now. And every June, I always like to do one that has to do with graduation. It takes place in Tahlequah, Oklahoma, on the Cherokee Nation, where the inaugural graduating class of Oklahoma State University's College of Osteopathic Medicine has just walked across the stage and accepted their diplomas. This is the first physician training program on a Native American reservation uh, in you know recent history. 25 Native students between Oklahoma State University's two College of Medicine campuses, the one that's on Cherokee Nation and the one that's in Tulsa, graduated this year, and they represent 14 Native American tribes. So this is just a huge deal for a lot of different reasons. The partnership between Cherokee Nation and Oklahoma State began about four years ago. Cherokee Nation put $40 million toward this new building. And when you walk into the building of the medical school, the oath of commitment is right there, written in both English and in Cherokee syllabary. So it's really from the jump, like from when you walk in the door, committed to understanding that this is a medical college that is devoted to being in the space where it is housed. And that doesn't just stop with walking in the door. The people who go to the medical school, whether or not they identify as Native people, train to be doctors, uh, and their study includes uh, work with Indigenous healers and work with Indigenous gardens, and they shadow Native doctors and watch them dealing with their Native patients to understand sort of uh, that form of listening. And all of this is, of course, to just train great doctors, but there's a special focus that's put on maybe training doctors who want to stay in these uh, in Cherokee Nation and in similar places where there is a shortage of Native American doctors. Something like 0.3 percent of American physicians are indigenous. And there's also just a shortage of any kind of doctor uh, in rural areas, which is where a lot of Cherokee Nation identifies as like small rural places. And I think folks are realizing that having a place where you can recruit people who are most likely to stay in the places where they grew up is going to be a a boon for public health. So huge, huge, big news, something to be super proud of and a great inaugural class. Congratulations to them. Absolutely. I mean, uh, I can only imagine if I was somebody who was Native American, the comfort that I might feel from having my medical provider also kind of look like me and have potentially a a similar experience to me would just go a long way because that kind of trust, that relationship with your medical provider is like a big part of the whole thing working. Yeah. And even if you don't look like your patients, if you've been trained by people who understand your patients on a kinship level or on a community level, like that's just going to train a force of doctors who can help uh, this group in need, rural folks, native folks. So it's win-win. Sweet. From patience, Elena, to something that takes kind of a lot of patience. Ouch. <laughs> that's terrible. I'm going to give you a PhD in puns this this I want to apologize season. to the Livewire listeners for that one. Uh, my best news story comes from Seoul, South Korea, where they recently held the International Spaced Out Competition. Now, this is not a race to space. This is a competition where what you are doing is you are trying to lower your heart rate to the lowest of anyone in the group without falling asleep. That's the biggie. (laughs) You're not allowed to fall asleep. And they've done this in a whole bunch of different countries. It happened to be in Seoul, South Korea this year, but it's actually a really interesting idea. It was started in 2014. And it is just to really drive home the idea that just sitting and just being is not a waste of time at all. It's something that we should all be doing more of probably. And it's actually something that, you know, you can make a competition out of to really drive the point home, particularly in a place like Korea in the article that I was reading where there can be a lot of social pressure around school and their people work really long work weeks to have a bunch of folks. If you're like hustling through the town square in Seoul and you see a bunch of people sitting, by the way, it was raining. So everyone's covered in these like cool, like rain ponchos. The winner was Valentina Vilches, who's actually originally from Chile, but she's a psychology consultant. It does not list like what her heart rate got down to. Oh, I wanted to know. 
I know, right? Is it like one beat per hour? Is that even healthy? When is it <laughs> clinical death? I don't yeah. know. When have you flatlined? Yeah. I mean, that's the problem for me is if I have to sit with my own thoughts and feelings quietly, it feels like a certain kind of death to me. My heart rate goes up if I have to sit and do nothing. I just have a panic attack. I think, though, that's the kind of thing that the more you do it, the better you get at it. People who do these, you know, silent meditation retreats and things like that. I think it's just it's a muscle like anything else. Mine is just very flabby. Very, very flabby, Elena. <laughs> um, the uh, first prize uh, was a uh, a trophy that was made sort of uh, like Rodin's The Thinker and then also the pensive Bodhisattva, which is, I guess, a national treasure in South Korea. So it was a gold statue that was kind of a combination of those two iconic figures. And uh, Valentina took it home. Something to aspire for, honestly, if you're people like you and me yeah. uh, who have a hard time with that. A heart racingly good game. I guess it was a heart slowingly good competition. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Something that we could all probably use a little more practice on. So that's the best news that I heard this week. Let's get our first guest on out. She's been a correspondent on Comedy Central's The Daily Show since 2017, where her segments have garnered millions of views. Her Comedy Central Presents stand-up special was named some of the best comedy of the year by The New York Times. And her first book, Hello, Friends, Stories of Dating, Destiny, and Day Jobs, is available now. This is Dulce Sloan, who joined us on stage at Town Hall in Seattle, Washington. Welcome to Livewire. Thank you so much. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory to God. Um, you uh, write in the, in the beginning of this book, your new book, Hello Friends, that it is, uh, for folks who, who read it, a view into who you really are, not the version of you that they might see at a comedy club or on The Daily Show. Mm -hmm. uh, what is it that you feel like you can say in this book about yourself that you don't feel like you can put out there in the other venues? No, I always say what I want. Um, it's just, I just wanted just to get, just give people a chance to just know who I was. Cause like, I wanted to call it, cause the book's called Hello Friends, Stories of Dating, Destiny, and Day Jobs. I wanted to call it, don't call it a memoir, I'm only 39. <laughs> and, which is hilarious. <laughs> and the publisher was like, oh, we don't want to tell people what it's not. And I was mm. like, but that was funny. What are you talking about? <laughs> That's a good joke. <laughs> so I did get conned by my manager into writing this book. Because um, people were like, what made you write a book? And I was like, obligations. Um, <laughs> it's shocking how often that is what gets someone to write a book. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if your manager likes to trick you into opportunities. Um, <laughs> and so I immediately called Michelle Buteau and I was like, how do I do this? Because, you know, she has her book, yeah. Survival of the Thickest, and it's not a Netflix show. Her. So she was like, well, start with stories that are too long to tell on stage. Hmm. So like, you got to have more context behind them. You just need more of a backstory. So I started there. And then it was like, okay, well, some people would want to know about my childhood. And then my time on The Daily Show. So that's how I kind of, like, planned everything out. Um, we're talking to Dulce Sloan about her new book, Hello, Friends. You talk about your mom being very supportive of mm -hmm. your... Um, the fact that you wanted to be in entertainment, that you wanted to be a performer. A lot of parents might say, well, try to figure out a you know, a safer plan. That was not your mom, you write. She would help make your costume. She was very supportive, except for this one thing, which was color guard, which <laughs> yeah. she brought up fairly recently. It was very odd. So it's so funny, because like my mom would sometimes be backstage at shows, and sometimes comics would go, so you're like supportive of Dulce doing stand up? She's like, yeah. And one was like, and they would go, can we have a hug? So, <laughs> and she's like, sure. They're like, why? She's like, because my mom hates this. It's so nice that you're supportive. Um, but I think the reason my mom is supportive is because my uncle is Stevie B. So he's a professional I, yeah. singer. Dude, we were so, roller skating to yeah. Because I Love You yes. here at Linwood Roll Away. <laughs> I was blown away that that's your Stevie B is your uncle. So he's my mom's youngest brother. Wow. So she has four brothers and my uncle Steve is the youngest above all the boys and so I think because my uncle's been working as a performer mm. literally my entire but since before I was born it wasn't a wild thing mm. to see it's like well my brother did it and my brother's been successful at it so let me be supportive 
Um, Because I think my grandma was supportive of my uncle. So it wasn't a wild thing in my family to be able to see. Yeah, so like when I started, because I did theater all through school, and at one point I was like, oh, it'd be fun to like do color guard, because it's just no twirling of flags and a wooden rifle. I was like, eh, be outside. (laughs) And I thought my mom just didn't want me to be near the football team. That's what I thought it was. Because I started high school with D-cup titties. I should have been way more popular. <laughs> um, but even then, you know, boys respected me. So, I mean, not as much as they should have. But, <laughs> you know, you still get in trouble the ways you get in trouble. Um, me and my mom were both sitting in our respective cars in the driveway in our house in Atlanta. And my brother was like, I guess he was doing yard work. He was just standing there holding the rake. And <laughs> I don't know why I randomly asked my mom. I said, like, if something came up, I was like, Mama, why did you not want me to do color guard? And again, I thought her answer would be because of the football team. She was like, oh, I was supposed to use my gas for you to twirl a flag. I was like, what? <laughs> and she's like, I was supposed to use my gas for you to twirl a flag. What kind of career opportunities was you going to get? <laughs> from twirling a damn flag. That's not a salary position. What were you gonna do? Go from office building to office building, raising a flag every morning? That's not a full-time job. And it was just this 15-minute rant. And me and my brother were like, what the hell is going on? And she said, no, it's better be you in theater. It's not to spend my money for you to twirl a damn flag. I was like, okay, thank you. It was a very interesting perspective because she was like, that's not a salary position, raising up flags in front of buildings every morning. And I ain't a full time. I was like, oh, you thought, thought about this. Okay. <laughs> this is Livewire from PRX. We're at Town Hall this week talking to Dulce Sloan, whose new book is Hello Friends, Stories of Dating, Destiny, and Day Jobs. Stick around. We'll be back with more in just a moment. Hey, welcome back to Livewire from PRX here at Town Hall. I'm Luke Burbank here with Elena Passarello, and we're very honored to be joined by Dulce Sloan from The Daily Show and many other places, including now the new book, Hello Friends, Stories of Dating, Destiny, and Day Jobs. Something that you write about in the book, which I was wanted to make sure I was properly grasping was you speak Spanish, but as si. I understand it, <laughs> you are, that is not because your parents were Spanish speakers. No. This was just, you spent your young life in Florida and just the environment and also elementary school was enough to teach you like fluent Spanish? Well, when we moved back, so me and my mom were both born in Miami in the same hospital. I think I was born in the room above where she was born. Um, and then we moved to Oklahoma, my brother was born, we moved to Colorado, and we moved to Georgia, and all of that happened before I started kindergarten. Mm. And then we moved back to Miami in 92 after Hurricane Andrew, and so I was in the fourth grade. And so I was like nine years old, so in Miami, you take Spanish every single day. I picked it up immediately, to the point by the time I was in the fifth grade, I was like helping translate stuff for my teacher. So I picked it up very fast. And then, so she'd call me to her and I was like, do say, And I was just like, uh, you got a teacher meeting at five o'clock today? <laughs> so, <laughs> and also my teachers were like, cause I think one of my teachers was Mexican, one of the teachers was Cuban. And so they're like, you're not gonna sound like, you're not gonna have an American accent. You're not gonna be uno dos trace in this classroom. <laughs> so we had to learn how to speak with an accent mm. And then we moved back to Atlanta. We lived in a predominant, like, we moved back to Atlanta. We moved to Norcross. And my neighborhood is predominantly Mexican, recent immigrants to America. And so I would have to help my neighbors register their kids for school. Um, One of our neighbors, her husband, got a DUI. So then I had to, like, I'm sitting there with the, I'm like, I'm sitting there with a Spanish English dictionary. And they're like, you don't know this? I said, this isn't even English. (laughs) This is legalese. I'm not a lawyer. I'm 14. So like, (laughs) can we give me a second? Also, talk to your husband. (laughs) So like, but I went with her to get like her health insurance at work. And so I was always like helping my neighbors out. Um, It was my minor in college. Okay. 
And then by the time I got into, after I graduated, I was doing bilingual customer service. So I was telling people in two languages, we cannot pick your trash up. Um, <laughs> we're not turning your lights back on until you pay your bill. Um, selling cars, I managed an auto body shop. My last job, I was selling stucco. <laughs> Well, you were doing all of this stuff as you were pursuing your career as a performer. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, you, you say in the book that uh, a lot of people, a lot, particularly women, particularly white women in stand-up talk about having a really hard time uh, getting respect and being taken seriously. And you write that, that you did not necessarily feel that, generally speaking, that you felt respected or at least you felt taken seriously. Um, here's the thing. When you're in a male-dominated industry and most of them don't want to sleep with you, they let you do your job. Huh. Mm -hmm. And that's what it was. Mm -hmm. Most of these dudes didn't want to sleep with me. So then I just had to be a comic mm -hmm. because I wasn't going to get the, well, this guy was DMing me and said that he wanted, because I had like, I also was like when I was doing, also people don't realize that like stand up still is very divided racially mm -hmm. because especially in like everywhere. Um, <laughs> but. <laughs> I was trying to say Atlanta, I'm like, no, it's the whole country. And so there's, there is urban, quote unquote, urban, so black rooms and then mainstream, which is white rooms. And so the styles of stand up is different, but also it's very hard as a woman to get into black rooms hmm. because they'll say, we already got one female on this show, we're not putting no more up. Hmm. So they're very, so it's like very, just there's a fixed number of women that they're putting on shows. And so I was like, I can keep doing this. Or I can be at this one club all night hoping I can get up. Or I can go to these white rooms. I'm still performing in a bar and I'm still getting paid in chicken wings. It's just who's <laughs> making these wings. Right. So are they just lemon pepper or buffalo is the question. That's <laughs> right. So instead of waiting at this one club on a Tuesday hoping to go up, I can go do two spots in these white rooms and know I'm going to get up. Mm -hmm. So for me, it was like, I'm just going where the opportunity is. Mm -hmm. And so I was able to go up more in white rooms because it wasn't, they weren't treating the women as like this finite commodity. Mm -hmm. It was like, if you sign up, you go up. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I was able to go back and forth. But yeah, it literally is, they didn't want to sleep with me. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't have to deal with a lot of the nonsense that some of the girls had to deal with. Mm -hmm. um, you write about, well, I mean, the name of the book is Dating Destiny and Day Jobs. Yes. And you, you maybe don't really name names because you're being sort of creative with how you describe people. Yes. But you definitely, like, describe teachers who you didn't like, who you felt treated you in a way that was probably racially motivated. Absolutely a, a guy, racially motivated. A guy who you dated who, I can't get that on my head, you said he was unfamiliar with going to the dentist and had, I think, fire breath. Have no, 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 no. I, I was, I, the, his breath was fine. Um, oh. oh, okay. Uh, I don't, listen, when you write a book, you don't remember everything. Um, <laughs> there's wondering, 240 pages. I don't I'm know everything people, I wrote down. I'm wondering if people in the book have, have seen the book or talked to you about the book. Well, what's interesting is one of the guys in the book did message me um, on Instagram, but I don't think Actually, I know he did not read it. Um, <laughs> he was just saying, hey, because <laughs> I know he didn't read it. Because, uh, you know, some, certain people don't read. Um, he's like, I had a dream with you in it. I'm just like, you are 10 years too late for this message. What do you want, <laughs> sir? Um, but I do use different monikers for was different Was it the people. mechanic? It was not the mechanic. The mechanic is very much married. Um, I did have a very cathartic moment with the mechanic uh, last year as in when I met him so we had been like talking for like two years when I started doing stand up and he would not come to any show mm. wouldn't come didn't want to um, I went back and forth with this man from I was 23 to I was like 31 right and I moved to LA and then I'm in New York and um, so now he's gotten married because he started the woman he married he met as soon as I moved to LA and so I am opening for Trevor last year. Trevor Noah. Trevor Noah. And he, uh, he came to the show. And I didn't know he was at the show. And so this, my mom came, and the show's over, and I get a text from him. Now, mind you, number not saved in the phone, but I know the number. And he was like, you had a great set. And I was like, where are you? And so <laughs> there's like this 
private club that's like inside the Fox Theater in Atlanta. And it's like the second time I'd open for Trevor in Atlanta. And so I meet up with him and then his wife is there. And I was like, what are you even doing here? And so the first time he ever saw me do stand up was at the Fox Theater. Wow. <laughs> opening for Trevor. And he's like, oh, I figured you'd be on the show because of how tight you and Trevor are at the desk. And I saw his wife's eyes light up like, the hell? <laughs> What was interesting is that the tickets for that show in Atlanta went on sale in November. The show was in January. I didn't know until two days before that I was going to even be opening for Trevor. So I could have not even been there. (laughs) But he bought tickets just assuming that I would be. And I kind of, and so I didn't, when I got in the car, I was like kind of crying because I had always wanted him to see me do stand up. And it was an old wound, like a very old wound from when I was like 27 Mm -hmm. that now at like 39 was like being healed. But then the other thing that was so great to me is the uncomfortable conversation I knew he was having with his wife in the car. (laughs) (laughs) And that is priceless. That's right. (laughs) And that is a perfect place to wrap this up. Dulce Sloan's new book is Hello Friends. Dulce, thank you so much. That was Dulce Sloan right here on Livewire. Make sure to check out her book, Hello Friends, Stories of Dating, Destiny, and Day Jobs. And of course, you can always check her out on The Daily Show. Hey, special thanks this episode to Rita Zante of Seattle, Washington, and Nicole Kittersong of Portland, Oregon. They are part of the Livewire member community and are generously supporting our show with a donation each month, which is huge. It's how we're able to do the show. So big thanks to Rita and Nicole for keeping Livewire going. This is Livewire. Each week, we like to ask our listeners a question. This week, we asked, who is an underappreciated artist you think more people should know about? Elena has been collecting up those responses. What do you see? Okay, so this first one is hands down my favorite. Tyler would like more people to know about Sarah McCraner. Luke, do you know who Sarah McCraner is? Not even a little bit. I I have actually seen I didn't know that her name but I'd seen her videos on TikTok and Instagram Reels. She does interpretive dances of things getting crushed by a hydraulic press. So you watch like a birthday cake being smushed or like a, you know, sedan and then she's just really good dancer who kind of like turns her body into that process and she's usually wearing clothes like in the color of whatever the item that's being squished is. And I, I, I'm, I would be embarrassed to tell you how many of her videos I have seen. <laughs> that is amazing. I mean, that might be the apotheosis of creativity in 2024. Like, I watched this one account where a woman, a British woman, is just responding to if she thinks it was a good smash or not. <laughs> like, she has certain kind that she likes and the other kinds that she doesn't really have time for. So what I'm watching is a woman's reviewing of one of those videos where some industrial process is smashing, like, a, a bowl of jello a bowling ball, a thing of Play-Doh. You're looking for the critical content, the uh, the commentary, <laughs> the color commentary of the smush. Nice. But I, I'm telling you, they are artists in a way, so good recommendation. What's another relatively unknown creator that one of our listeners want more people to know about? Now, this is sort of in the opposite direction because I know I don't have to tell you who this person is, but Marie thinks that Kelly Clarkson needs more love, more tours, more everything from the people. Her vocal chops are so powerful. And I agree. I feel like one day, I mean, she gets plenty of appreciation. People love her television show. Apparently she has a wonderful personality. But one day people are going to be like, that's one of the greatest interpreters of any songbook that we had in this decade or so. I mean, she can sing anything. I just saw, speaking of TikTok, I just saw a clip of her when she was just getting started. And I forget what she's maybe singing Breakaway or one of her Mm -hmm. early like big hits. But it's just one of those like in the studio kind of clips. And then she just breaks into the song and you're like, well, that's from another planet. That's not an instrument most of us are working with. 
Yeah. It's like, how how is that a part of her body? And I have the same body part because when I do it, it sort of sounds like foghorn leghorn. <laughs> hey, what's one more artist that one of our listeners thinks should get a little more do? I love this one from Lupita, who wants more people to know about, quote, the people who bake the fresh treats at my local bakery. <laughs> or at any bakery for that matter, exclamation point. I love you, bakers, three exclamation points. <laughs> you know what I learned the other day, Elena, and I want to mention I'm 48 years old. I learned that scones are really good. Oh, oh, yeah. I was getting, as a kid, the absolute worst scone selection that you could ever have. And so I filed it away under, I don't like those. And then I was getting some coffee and on a whim, I grabbed like a freshly baked scone and ate that with my, it might've been one of the best things I've ever eaten in my entire life. Yeah. Uh, your, your gateway scone, uh, really does affect. <laughs> you never forget, right? <laughs> well, thank you to everyone who sent in a response to our listener question. We've got another one for next week's show, which we will reveal in just a moment. In the meantime, we got to welcome our next guest over. He is an award-winning filmmaker from Portland, Oregon. His film Mothering Inside helped lead Oregon to become the first state to pass a bill of rights for the children of incarcerated parents. His latest project is Lost Angel, the genius of Judy Sill. It tells the real story of an L.A. folk singer in the 1970s who in just two years went from living in her car to appearing on the cover of Rolling Stone magazine and then back to relative obscurity. Film Threat warns it's the kind of film that buries itself in your ribcage and keeps glowing for days afterward. Brian Lindstrom joined us on stage at the Alberta Rose Theater in Portland. Hello, Brian. Hello. Welcome to the show. I loved this movie so much. It was one of those things where I watched it and then I immediately started texting people in my life I know who like enjoy great stories and enjoy great music. I'm wondering, how did you first even learn there was somebody named Judy Sill out there? Uh, well, I, I should say that filmmaking is a very collaborative effort. Mm -hmm. And um, I made this film with my good friend, Andy Brown, who was my co-director. And uh, right after YouTube came out, Andy showed me um, the clip of Judy performing The Kiss on the Old Grey Whistle Test, the BBC show, because he knew it would blow me away, and of course it did. And that kind of started us on this journey that uh, leads us here today. Um, what was it about her that intrigued you? Aside from liking the music, what was the thing that made you think, oh, this, there, we should have a whole movie about this person? Right. Well, it definitely was liking the music, but it was also getting to know her life story. And at first glance, the kind of um, strange dichotomy between her, uh, I would say, spiritual music and the kind of hard facts of her life, which mm -hmm. include armed robbery, prison time, things like that. Um, but as we got deeper into the story, uh, we realized that she was doing those things because she was so numbed out from childhood trauma that she was really just looking to feel something. And I think we can all relate to um, someone who is, in a way, trying to save their own life, but is going about it in ways that maybe aren't that healthy. <laughs> yeah. She was part of a, an armed robbery when she was really young, like 18 or something. Yeah. And uh, in the film, somebody says that her account of this was that she said, okay, mother sticker, this is a f up. <laughs> <laughs> That's true, yep. <laughs> Does that also sort of typify her general vibe in life? <laughs> well, she was definitely her own person, and she yeah. did everything, um, you know, kind of according to her own lights. Um, but what was so interesting about working on this film, because we eventually got her uh, diaries, and journals, and you know, Judy. Uh, when you heard the facts of her life, you kind of thought, okay, well, she's a great storyteller, and she's kind of you know, making this sound a little bit more interesting than maybe it was. But it was all true, everything. Yeah, you have all these newspaper clippings. I mean, rock and roll music is full of tall tales, and then she would talk about something like being sent to like a reform school or a robbery, <laughs> and then you're watching the film, and there's the clipping from some local newspaper about 18-year-old delinquent Judy Sill being in the wow. thing. Like, it all kind of checked out, I guess. Yeah. I mean, she learned to play uh, the church organ in reform school. Wow. <laughs> How would you describe her musical style? Like, we, we're saying folk, folk music, but what does right. that really mean? You know, I don't think folk music really does it justice. Um, you know, she was so gifted 
as Linda Ronstadt says in the film, you know, she had more chops than anyone on the scene with the exception of Brian Wilson, and that's pretty good company to be yeah. in. Another um, person who, you know, struggled. Right. You know, that, I mean, I don't want to generalize or make a diagnosis, but it does seem that sometimes the kind of brain that can make the music that Brian Wilson made and that Judy Sill made, that can be a pretty un, unquiet place. Yeah, and that was part of our motivation in making the film, you know, is really trying to figure out a way where... Uh, even though when we started, there was really no archive of Judy to speak of. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we really wanted to try to make a first-person film so that the audience could really be in Judy's head and understand what it is like to have that kind of a gift, what are the challenges, and also what is it like to have that kind of a gift and know that that music saved your life because Judy went from kicking heroin uh, on the floor of the L.A. County Jail with no aspirin, no nothing, in 1968 to being on the cover of Rolling Stone in 1972. Mm -hmm. And so she knew that that music saved her life, and she really felt like she was put on this earth to share that music with the masses and save their lives, too. So you decide you want to make this movie about her, but then you realize there's not really an archive of her stuff. It's not like trying to do a documentary about Bob Dylan or something. (laughs) There was no Instagram. Like, how do you actually put together the visuals of an entire movie about a person who was fairly, you know, unknown? Well, you know, it's kind of a, uh, an exercise in faith and you just kind of start out and know that like her music has touched me. (laughs) Her story touches me. I, I have faith that will touch other people. Um, We did our first round of interviews in 2013 um, in L.A., and what was so uh, heartening about that, and these were like Judy's dear friends, is um, they all had such specific stories about Judy, and she was still like a palpable presence in their lives. And so we knew that like if she's touching those people that way, if we can kind of do our jobs as filmmakers, I bet she'll touch an audience that way. So her musical style, as it sort of evolved, seemed to be this almost kind of um, ethereal, you know, she talked a lot about God and about sort of the spirit realm. Right. It was very artsy, and this was, she was on the same uh, Asylum Records, which was started by David Geffen. It's like her, like Jackson Brown, the Eagles, who am I forgetting from Asylum Records at that time? Joni Mitchell. Joni Mitchell. Oh, yeah, J.D. Souther. Right. So she's on this, like the label to be on at that time in L.A. if you're making this kind of music. And yet, even though she was sort of an artist's artist, all the cool people like Linda Ronstadt, you know, really loved her, her music didn't ever really click with the wider world. Why do you think that was? You know, I I don't know, of course, is the honest answer. Um, And I kind of bristle at the question just a little bit because like anyone who's listening... We can end this interview now, Brian. (laughs) I'm out of here. (laughs) Anyone who's listened to Judy's The Kiss, you know, I, I just can't even, like, put... You don't want to entertain the idea of it not connecting for someone? Exactly. Like, how could that possibly be put in the same sentence as she didn't make it? And yet I understand, of course, what you're asking. And, and I think the very things that um, maybe prevented her from making it you know, at that point in time uh, is the reason we're talking about her now. You know, the kind of timeless quality. Because, like, we really wanted to show Judy's legacy. You know, we, we felt like the film needed to have a kind of present tenseness to it. Mm-hmm. And we were so lucky to have, you know, Fleet Foxes and Big Thief and Wise Blood and Sean Colvin and, you know, people who really kind of cement and uh, exemplify Judy's legacy. I'm so fascinated by something that you just said about a major goal of this documentary was a first-person uh, approach, but the the first person obviously isn't here and and right. hasn't been here for a long time. So, what does that look like when you're a filmmaker to to not just tell the story of someone so that we can really feel it and understand it and understand the impact that they made, but to feel like we're inside the person? That's what you meant, right? Like that we're absolutely. Uh, you know, we feel like um, the film. You know, I hope this doesn't sound egotistical, but it's a hard hitting film. You know, I mean, it, you're dealing with someone who. Um, really grappled with some big questions in life and had some challenges and also had some incredible gifts. Mm -hmm. And we really wanted to help the audience kind of get inside that and understand from Judy's perspective what all that was like. And we were so lucky that um, I tracked down a uh, a retired journalist named Chris Van Ness, uh, who uh, used to write for the LA Free Press. And in 1972, he did this really comprehensive article on Judy which really kind of amounted to like an oral history of her life up to that point. 
And we thought, like, my God, if, if, if there's audio of that interview, we can have Judy narrate the film. And so I, uh, Chris didn't have much of a kind of online footprint. And so I wrote him a letter, and we, he got back to me, and uh, he said, you know, I'm, I'm wheelchair-bound, but I do think I have a tape of that interview in a box in my attic. Oh, my gosh. And I, uh, my uh, co-director, Andy Brown, lived in New York at the time, so he drove to Connecticut Wow. And met Chris, and Chris, you know, was guiding him from the bottom of the stairs up to the right. <laughs> uh, and so we got the audio tape, and at that point, the tape has been in a box for literally 50 years, and we don't know if there's any audio information on the tape. Oh and God. one of the biggest eureka moments in, in making the film was when we had it, you know, digitally transferred, and we play it, and you can hear the first kind of syllables of Judy's voice. And it's like, <laughs> first of all, it, it felt like a strange, like, there's Judy, you know, because mm. I hadn't heard her speaking voice before that. Wow. Really. Oh my gosh. And that must have been emotional. I it mean, was. For a lot of reasons. Yeah, and it was also just a hell of a relief because we knew that <laughs> right. we have a narrator now. Yeah, right? <laughs> yeah, you did something also really, I thought, kind of interesting with the film where, because she was a, apparently a real meticulous diary keeper, she wrote a lot of things down, and you, you sort of animate those in her different, you know, handwriting and how she was feeling in the moment. And it really does kind of bring her alive. Was she, did you just find a bunch of her diaries or was she writing in the margins of like the music? Where are you getting this written material from her? Well, that's an interesting story. My co-director Andy, Andy Brown, um, tracked down Judy's cousin who had all of those journals in a box mm. and was just like, I don't, you know, here, here you go. <laughs> <laughs> and so for the longest time, like all of Judy's kind of journals and letters and things were in a box in Andy's apartment <laughs> in New York. Um, and we kind of like slowly acquired or, you know, got the archive of, of everything Judy, you know, and like even like the bills of her uh, hospital stays mm. and, you know, it was in her address book mm. in which she wrote uh, Judy Sill, no home ever. Wow. wow. You know, it That's was intense. it was also like a um, we, we felt like we were entrusted with something. You know, we felt like, oh, my God, this is like a, a, a gift that's been bestowed upon us. And we really need to honor honor her, you know, with what we did with the film. It was an interesting experience watching it because I became so connected with her and I was rooting for her so mm -hmm. hard. And I think I had a sense of how the movie was going to end. Right. But I kept thinking, well, maybe she gets famous. Maybe she's like, <laughs> maybe she wins eight Grammys and right. tours with the Rolling Stones. I don't know. I was like wanting the actual sort of march of time and the facts of the world to change for her right. because I found her to be so interesting. And again, I was just, I just wanted things to go well for her because of everything she'd been through. Well, you know, she's bigger now than she ever was in life. And people are continually to, you know, rediscover her music. And, uh, you know, through the, the people that she's touched, her music lives on. And, uh, you know, I, I think that Judy's life also has a lot to give us, not just her music. And one thing that was really uh, empowering for me um, was, you know, what I love about Judy is she really kind of, like, throws us upon ourselves in interesting ways, and there's some things about her music and her life we just have to grapple with. And one is, you know, the fact of her death. Unintentional heroin overdose, and at that point, um, you know, th this was like before addiction was even considered really a disease. And so on her death certificate, it says suicide, mm. you know, which is so such a hard, you know, thing to look at. Um, and something that a lot of people in the film wanted to really kind yeah. of dispel. Absolutely. People that knew her were like, this was not somebody who took their own life. Right. And that seemed very important to them. Absolutely. I mean, you know, every one of them said she wanted to live. You know, mm. she was a person who had an addiction and. Uh, she wanted to live. Another thing that was uh, really impressive about all the people that knew Judy was, um, besides how much they cared for her, was how much fun they said she was. Mm. You know, and it was really uh, empowering for Andy and I and, and, and the crew to know that, like, this wasn't like a one-note downer person, mm -hmm. the kind of, like, you know, tortured artist. She was like the life of a party. She uh, was a dear friend. She knew when everyone's birthdays were. Hmm. She would bring people together for every holiday. You know, she was really a, you know, a, a loving, bright person. Yeah, like as soon as she got some money, she got like a house in the valley with a swimming pool and was just like the fun place to be until she ran out of the money. Right. <laughs> Which is all we can hope for in a friend. So if they get some money, they get a house in the valley with a swimming pool. So... Um, Brian, it's a really, really great film. I hope everybody gets a chance to see it. Um, Brian Lindstrom, everybody, right here on Livewire. Thank you so much. Thank you. 
That was Brian Lindstrom right here on Livewire. His film, Lost Angel, the genius of Judy Sill, is available on streaming services right now. I'm Luke Burbank. That's Elena Passarella. We have to take a very quick break, but don't go anywhere. When we come back, we're going to hear some music that will absolutely break your heart in the best way from the wonderful S.G. Goodman. Stay with us. Livewire is thrilled to be partnering with Portland's own Portal Tea this season. Formerly known as Tea Chai Tay, Portal Tea is the premier tea company in the Pacific Northwest. And they make one-of-a-kind handcrafted tea blends like cinnamon churro chai and blueberry cream Earl Grey. Use the code LIVEWIRE, all lowercase, for 20% off at portaltea.co. Welcome back to Livewire from PRX. I'm Luke Burbank here with Elena Passarello. Okay, before we get to our musical guest, a little preview of next week's show. We are going to be talking to comedian, writer, and Livewire pal Hari Kondabolu. Of course, you've heard him on Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me, seen him on The Late Show with David Letterman. And he's also got a comedy special out called Vacation Baby, which he intentionally did not title Pandemic Baby for reasons that will become clear when you hear Hari on the show. Then we're going to talk to Christy Coulter about her book, Exit Interview, The Life and Death of My Ambitious Career. It's a memoir recounting the intense and sometimes soul-crushing work culture she says she dealt with while working as an executive at Amazon. And by the way, we recorded this conversation in Seattle, mere blocks from Amazon's world headquarters because we like to live dangerously on this show, Elena. We had extra security ringing Town Hall in Seattle for that interview. Plus, we're going to get some music from indie rock royalty, the band Quasi. And we're also going to be looking to get your answer to our listener question. Elena, what are we asking the Livewire listeners for next week's show? Okay, fasten your seatbelts. We want to know what is the craziest thing that a kid has ever said to you? Oh, gosh. (laughs) They do say the darndest things, don't they? I have heard that they do. If you have an answer to our question, what's the craziest thing a kid has ever said to you? Go ahead and hit us up on social media. We're at Livewire Radio pretty much everywhere. This is Livewire from PRX. Our musical guest this week is equally at home at the Grand Ole Opry as she is standing behind a tiny desk of the NPR variety. She spent her childhood in Western Kentucky as a devoted member of the Southern Baptist Church before earning a degree in philosophy, which for her kind of put an end to the whole Southern Baptist thing, as did her coming out as queer and joining the politically active indie music scene. Her music has taken her all over, playing with folks like Jason Isbell and Tyler Childers. Rolling Stone calls her an untamed rock and roll truth teller. And we met her at the James Theater as part of the Mission Creek Festival, a multi-day music and literature festival that takes place every spring in downtown Iowa City, Iowa. Take a listen to S.G. Goodman playing her song, Teeth Marks, here on Livewire. You 
see things my way See things my way Oh, ooh. oh maybe in time You'll see things my way See things my way No, you say that ooh, or maybe in time you'll see things my way, see things my way. Oh, ooh, or maybe in time you'll see things my way, see. It's just like you to say something smart Telling me how this shouldn't break my heart But it did Oh, you know it did Oh, you know it did That was S.G. Goodman right here on Livewire. Make sure to check out her album, Teeth Marks, which is out now. That is going to do it for this episode of the show. A huge thanks to our guests, Dulce Sloan, Brian Lindstrom, and S.G. Goodman. Special thanks this week to Mission Creek Festival, Nina Lohman, Brian Johansson, Sarah Band Books, and Joanna Englert. Laura Haddon is our executive producer. Heather D. Michelle is our executive director. And our producer and editor is Melanie Sevchenko. Eben Hoffer is our technical director. And our house sound is by D. Neil Blake. Trey Hester is our assistant editor. Rosa Garcia is our operations associate. Jackie Ibarra is our production fellow. And Becky Phillips is our intern. Our house band is Ethan Fox Tucker, Sam Tucker, Zach Pony Domer, Jacob Miller, A.L. Alves, and A. Walker Spring, who also composes our music. This episode was mixed by Molly Pettit and Trey Hester. Additional funding provided by the James F. and Marion L. Miller Foundation. Livewire was created by Robin Tenenbaum and Kate Sokoloff. This week, we'd like to thank members Rita Zante of Seattle, Washington, and Nicole Kittersong of Portland, Oregon. For more information about our show or how you can listen to our podcast, head on over to livewireradio.org. I'm Luke Burbank for Elena Passarello and the whole Livewire crew. Thank you for listening, and we will see you next week. Dear Livewire, when we first met, I was really shy. I had no idea we'd spend so much time together or that you'd be one to fill my heart with with joy and make me want to be a better person. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't know you were here. I was busy reading a review from one of our many, many rapturously smitten listeners. Oh, wait, actually, no, sorry. This is from Elena. Anyway, the point is, uh, it would be really helpful if you wanted to leave us a review Feel free to say really nice things about us, and uh, we'll even read them now and then on the show. So you might hear your review of LiveWire read on the program itself. 
Uh, reviews help other people hear about the show, and then we can keep doing this for a long, long time because we love having this job. Uh, thank you so much if you've left a review, and if you're about to leave a review, you can go ahead and do it right where you get the podcast.